All right, um, we're going to start out in Romans chapter 16 today. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. I want to talk about seven reasons for a house church. And um, and then we're going to look at, that's going to be the first part of this sermon, is what the Bible has to say about a house church versus a church building. And then the second part of the message is going to be how to start a house church, what you need to do. Um, I think there's a something happening here in America, and I, I believe probably around the world as well, and that is basically all over the country, I'm hearing this, I'm reading this, that Christians are frustrated because there are no churches. Every church that they go to, it's the same thing. It's worldly compromise, it's rock and roll music, it's new Bible versions, it's everything. And Christians that that are King James Bible believing, or even just just conservative type Christians are faced with a situation where there's just no place to fellowship. And I'm, I'm seeing this all over the internet. People are saying, where do I go? You know, I've tried every church and it's the same thing and I can't be part of it. It's all about money. It's all about just pleasure and fun and the love gospel. And, and what do I do? You know, and, and Christians are looking for answers. And of course, you have a nation like China, well, they they forsook the established churches a long time ago, and they've been worshiping in houses. So we're going to look this morning at what the Bible has to say about house churches. And I just want to say that there are some uh, preachers, actually a lot of preachers in America, who are very, very much against house churches. Uh, Marty, an old friend of, of ours, uh, he was saying about how his pastor wants to write a book against house churches and how that it's heretical well i'm sorry it's not heretical and we're going to look at that okay reason number one for a house church it's scriptural romans chapter 16 verse 5 here paul is writing to all the different people greet all these different people and he, and he says here likewise greet the church that is in their house salute my well-beloved epineatus who is the first fruits of Okay, I unto Christ. Okay, so you see, there's a church in their house. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Alright, we read, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. Again, you see it there. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now we're going to look at the qualifications for a bishop here, and you're going to see a couple of very interesting things here. The first seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 3 talk about a bishop, which we would call today a pastor. Okay, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. Sorry, no female preachers. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Hmm. Kind of interesting there. If you have a house church, you would need to be given to hospitality. Apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Um, <clears throat> I will say one of the problems with the house church movement is the charismatics have kind of come along and preempted a good house church movement. And they, they have this philosophy. I have a book called uh, Pagan Christianity. And it's a good book. It has a lot of, he makes a lot of good points, but the guy's very heretical in some of his beliefs. And one of his things is that every member is supposed to function in the thing and that there should never be a pastor. Well, sorry, but that's not what the Bible teaches. You have somebody who's been around, that's been saved longer, that's been in the Word more, it's their job to be an overseer and to feed the flock of God. That's what Jesus Christ said to Peter. 
feed my sheep, you know, over and over and over. That's what your job is as a pastor. And you're not to be a novice. Okay? And I've said this in another sermon, and he was a good man. I'm not trying to destroy him now that he's dead and gone and everything, but Bob Jones Sr. started preaching when he was 13. I don't care how spiritual you are, how much Bible you know, God never called anybody to preach when they're 13. You do not know enough about the world when you're 13 years old to be an overseer. I'm sorry, no way. You know, he lived in a different time, early 1900s and whatever, but 13 years old is too young. A Christian should be trained up in the things of the Lord to the point where they have been fed appropriately. Now they can take what they've been fed and feed other people. That's the job of a pastor. Okay? Um, <clears throat> turn to Philemon 2, chapter 1, verse 2. I always like to say that. There's only one chapter. Uh, Philemon, verse 2. And to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So again, you see... A house church. Okay, they're mentioned all throughout the New Testament. And if you go back into the book of Acts and you look at the progression of the Christian church, how it went from when Jesus Christ was still with them to basically, you know, up through till when Paul got saved and the gospels revealed to him and the preaching of the Jews and then they went to the Gentiles. You look at the development of the church, they never God never told them to build a building and call it a church. And we're going to look at that as this progresses. But <clears throat> I actually heard a message. A guy was speaking against house churches, and he talked about that they were meeting in the temple in the book of Acts. Now, what was the temple? He's right. They did meet in a temple, but what was it? It was Jewish. And were they welcome there? No. <laughs> in fact, they were thrown in prison because they were speaking in the temple. And in the synagogue, they were, you know, proselytizing. And it's interesting because they were thrown in prison the one time. And the Lord, Jesus actually broke them out of jail and said, go back to the temple and preach. So you have another thing there with the modern church where you're not to proselytize and all this stuff. They were proselytizing in the book of Acts. And Jesus actually got thrown in jail and Jesus broke them out and said, go back. So that's kind of an interesting thought there. But... No, I'm fine. <clears throat> uh, okay, point number two. Turn to Ephesians chapter one. Point number two is, and this is one which I think a lot of people do not understand, is that the church is not a building. Okay, you know, and that that's something that is so ingrained in our society. It's just it almost seems heretical to say that you know a church is not a building. But I want to before I want to, before I read that, let me read a couple verses here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter two verse forty seven says, "Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved." Was he adding uh, additions to a church building? Is that what it means? No, he was adding to the body of Christ, which is the church. Acts five eleven, and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. How can fear come on a building? Can't. The church is not a building. Acts chapter 8 verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The church was scattered. Does that mean, you know, a door was over here and a couple boards over there and some bricks over there? No. It was a people. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Now look at this. Entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. I'll just read two more here. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 27. And when they were come together and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So again, you see the church gathering together. It's people. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost 
hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's people. It's not a building. Okay, now let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Okay, and he and excuse me, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now how can you have a building be the body of Christ? Can't be. The church is not a building, it's the body of believers. Turn over to Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty two. Ephesians 5:22. We're going to look at a couple of verses here that show the same thing. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I know some of the believers try to put that into actual you know, practice, having a spotless church but <laughs> as a building. But the fact is, this is not talking about a building. Someday, the church, the body of Christ, which we are all part of here this morning, we will be presented to Jesus Christ as being perfect. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed us from all our sins, all unrighteousness. Okay, That's how we will be presented, as a perfect church. Not down here, we're not perfect, but we will be up there when we get there. But if you want to make the word church a building, how do you reconcile it with these verses here? You can't. It's impossible. And I want to show you the danger of having a building and calling it a church. And something that's very interesting, I looked this up. You'll hear this thing a lot now, and they say that you should be part of a local church. You, you know, you, you need to be part of a local church. Well, guess what? The term local is not even in the Bible. There is no local church in the Bible. It's very interesting. And, and it's kind of, it goes against the teachings of Scripture because in the Bible, it's the responsibility of the pastors and Christians, really, to go and teach people. You go to them. You know, that's, that's the responsibility of a Christian. But with the, this local church philosophy, well, you build a building and then everybody's supposed to come to the building. See, it's, it goes directly contrary to the Bible. Okay, because, and I've heard people say, you know, well, if there's not a good local church in your area, well, you need to move. You need to go somewhere. So now we have, instead of Christians being dispersed and in, and in all the different communities out there where they can teach neighbors and they can teach people, oh no, we've got to make campsites now. Christian campsites where you come to the church building, to your local church, you know, and you help support this corporation, which they are listed as corporations now. I mean, it's just crazy. Totally unscriptural. And then they have the audacity to say that house churches are heretical. No, they're not. You know, we're doing it the Bible way. Okay, but now, how many times... Have I mean, we've run into this door-to-door -door numerous times. Uh, you go up, knock on the door, guy comes to the door, you say, uh, we're just out here today, you know, trying to see if people know where they're going when they die. If you were to die today, do you know for sure where you'd go? Well, I think I'd go to heaven. Well, how do you know that? And what do they say? I go to church. Now think about that. That statement's not in the Bible. Go to church, going to church. I have right here, I printed out all references to the word church and churches. Not one time does it say, go to church. And you say, well, would you like to be saved? Am I going to have to go to church? That's another thing they say. They equate this thing in their mind 
with I have to be part of a building to be saved. See? And, and think about it from the other side, the flip side of that. Well, I can act how I want to act six days out of the week, but on the seventh day, Sunday, I go to the building there, and then I'm in church, and then I have to act differently. See? You see the problem there? It's, it's totally against, you know, it goes contrary to the scriptures. And, but that's what they do. So, you know, that's why I'm not, you know, has God used church buildings? Yes. Have people gotten saved in church buildings? Yes. I'm not saying that this is some kind of an arch heresy. If you have a church building, you know, you should burn it down because it's of the devil. I'm not saying that. But the point is, has God used church buildings? Yes. But now let me ask the other question that people don't want to think about. Has the devil used church buildings? Yes. Who's used them more? The devil has damned quite a few people. Well, because I'm part of the church. I'm a, I'm a member here. I'm a respected member. I'm here when the doors are open. Yeah, but do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I go to church. <laughs> you know, no. It doesn't work. And, you know, it, it was so weird. Different places we've been, you know, where the three of us, you know, well, the last church we were going to, church building we were going to, the people would think it was so strange that we would be standing around talking about the Bible. You know? Why are you standing around? You know, these guys, oh, they're kind of unique. You know, they stand around and talk about the Bible. And it's like, yeah. You know? But it's interesting. Let me make another point. The church, in those verses that we looked up in Acts, and you can look them up, I mean, every reference to the church, it's all about a body of believers. It's all about people. It's not about buildings. But it's kind of interesting because right now, you know, and, and, and Peter talks about, you know, that you are like, it's, it compares us to lively stones. And, you know, I didn't bring any down today, but, you know, it's kind of like you have little Lego blocks. And each little block is a Christian. And you get a couple together and they click together and they click here and they click here and they click there. And it kind of creates a little church. But that church is living. It's made up of living stones. It's not a dead building. And right now, our church is here in Stevens. And middle of the week, we're going to be in Africa. Saturday, we had one of the wings of the church out going door to door. We'll call it the right wing. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's living. Now think about something. Is Jesus Christ dead or alive? So is his body dead or alive? The Bible says his body is the church. How can you make it into a dead building in an inanimate object just sitting there? And I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm going to make a point on that later. Okay, point number three. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> Uh, point number three, modern church buildings bring lost and saved together. Okay, now if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll read the first three verses here very quickly. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in a day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Okay, then verse 4 down through 10, you have Paul giving, you know, what you go through as a minister of Jesus Christ. This whole thing is talking about ministry. Uh, verse 11 through 13, you have, he's talking to the Corinthians, explaining some things. But verse 14, let's read this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." 
Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now let me make a point here. The orthodox traditional interpretation of those verses, verse 14 through 18, is marriage. That you're not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever in marriage. Well, I can tell you, marriage does not appear in there. Look at the context. I mean, take the context of the entire chapter. It's talking about ministry. It has nothing to do with marriage. Now, is it instruction in righteousness for marriage? Sure, yeah. You know, it's it's sound wisdom to not marry somebody who's lost? Yeah, sure. But you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, and it talks about being married to an unbeliever, and if, and if the two of you get along, that you're not to leave them. You're to stay with them. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and, you know, vice versa. So... Yeah, you shouldn't marry somebody who's lost, but if you are and you get along, the Bible says you're not supposed to leave them. How do you reconcile that with this? See? Like I said, instruction in righteousness, okay. But I believe that this thing has to do with coming together in church. You're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For Look at it. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You know, our ministry here, our church, is called Bible Believers Fellowship. That's what we are. We are Bible believers, and we come together for fellowship. Now, let's throw a couple lost people in here. Let's, you know, the people we met yesterday. You know, the one guy yelling at us because he was saying we were soliciting another guy, you know, swearing and yelling about religion and you're all hypocrites and the Bible's contradiction and all that. Let's invite him into our church this morning. Are we going to get along? Would they be sitting there quiet, respectfully looking at, you know? No. Why would we bring them in to this fellowship here of believers? Uh, and what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? See? And then it goes into verse 16 there. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. See, it's talking about believers. It's not talking about a married couple. Okay? It's talking about the temple of God. But that's exactly what they're doing in the modern church movement. You have Rick Warren going around saying about unchurched Sam. And how can we get in unchurched Sam? Do what you need to do. You know, he, he there's a thing on uh, YouTube, you can watch this, you can look it up, where he had a youth rally recently, Rick Warren did. I think it was just this past year. And he was speaking to thousands of youth, and he had them. He, it was, it's interesting because during the speech he said he compared them to Hitler youth. And he said we need to be just as fanatical as they were. And he said, if you are willing to do whatever it takes, then hold up this red card that says whatever it takes. And they were showing pictures. Brainwashed. And they're holding up these for whatever it takes. That's not scriptural. We're not to do whatever it takes to get people saved. The Bible has the method. Okay, this is the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to take people to the cross Show them that they're a sinner. Show them that they need to turn from those sins, turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and that it's His blood that washes our sins away. That's the technique. That's the way, the method of salvation. There is no other way. But to say whatever it takes, see? And now let me ask the question here again. Okay, let's bring in unchurched sin. What do we have to do to get the unchurched in? We have to compromise. We have to become worldly. We have to make it comfortable for unchurched Sam when he comes in. We have to bring in more money. We have to bring in more entertainment. We have to bring things to draw the people. You know? There was a guy, um, oh, I can't think, one of the big Hollywood producer guys, Metro Goldwyn Mayer or whatever. Uh, he was a Jewish guy, a lost man. And they, they said, what's your philosophy? And he said, 
See if I can get this right. Satisfy the masses, don't offend the classes, is what he said. That's the same philosophy of the modern church. It's the exact same philosophy. Satisfy the masses, don't offend the classes. Yeah. The only people, in fact, that the modern churches offend in reality is Bible-believing Christians. And it's interesting because those are the ones that they will attack the most. You know, and we're going to look at that in just a little bit. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 there, I don't believe for one minute that that has anything to do with uh, marriage, what, I mean, other than instruction and righteousness. I believe that that has to do with uh, Christians coming together to worship the Lord. And you know, I want to make one other point before I move on here. The song, the, the hymn that we sang this morning, Living for Jesus, you know, you're going to get lost people singing that? You know, let's bring them together and let's all just sing it. And, and it's interesting because you literally have people in a church building that are not in church, in the church, you know. So they're in church, but they're not in the church. Kind of strange. Okay, turn over to Philippians 2. One of our uh, statements here at Bible Believers Fellowship is that we are a one accord fellowship. And you can read about that. It's interesting because the statement one accord in terms of people being in agreement, it appears seven times in the Bible. Interesting number. Acts chapter 1 verse 14, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, Acts chapter 2 verse 46, chapter 4 verse 24, 5, 12, and 15, 25. And then the seventh time that it appears is here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. We'll read down to verse 3. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now that is a true picture of what a church should be coming together, not being proud, not being arrogant, you know, esteeming others better than themselves, you know. But also, we're to have the same, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. How's that possible when you have lost people in the mix? It isn't, you know. And that's why... To be part of this fellowship here, we're not a cult. You know, we are certainly open to discussing other beliefs and debating things with people. You know, that's fine. We don't, we don't, you know, force people to believe a certain way or something. We just simply say, hey, if if you're not in the same mind here, if you profess to be a Christian, but you use the new versions and you think the Pope's good and whatever, <laughs> and you like Rick Warren, you know, then don't come here. We can't fellowship with you. We're not in one accord. Okay? We have a ministry to accomplish for the Lord. We have a very short time here. The Bible talks about redeeming the days, redeeming the time, excuse me, because the days are evil. There's a lot of work that we have to do. There's a lot of study we have to do. We don't need to have strife, contention with people that are here that don't agree with our beliefs. You know? That's just the way it is. You don't agree with us? Well, go somewhere else. There's plenty of other churches out there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1.10 also speaks of the same thing. We're not going to turn there for sake of time, but it talks about being of the same mind, same judgment, same spirit. How's that possible, by the way, with uh, 200 new Bible versions? It is impossible. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. We'll look at the next point here. Try to keep this thing moving along. Romans chapter 13, verse 8, point number 4. Church buildings are an incredible waste of money. Okay, Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Can you build a big, huge building and fill it full of people without getting into debt? I'd never heard of it. I mean, maybe back in the old days, they'd build a little church building. You know, the people would get together and they'd, you know, they'd 
guys would cut the trees down, make a log building or something like that. Well, okay, somebody donates the some of the money and whatever. I'm not so much against that, you know. But these church buildings, I mean, it, it's insane. They're putting millions and millions of dollars into these places, uh, which I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm going to give you a statistic here, but Titus chapter 3, verse 14. We'll look at another one. This is another important verse here at uh, Bible Believers Fellowship. This is one that we really focus a lot on and ask, you know, kind of critique ourselves and what we're doing by this verse. Titus 3, 14. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You know, we've been part of church buildings and many times, instead of going out, getting out the gospel on a Saturday, you're working on the building. Painting this, cleaning that. That's what you do most of the time. You know? Where in the Bible, where in the New Testament do you see the Christians spending time landscaping and vacuuming floors and painting walls and things? And mowing the grass, yeah, you know, huge, big grass fields and everything. It's, yeah, it's not in there. Um, but there. I have a very interesting statistic here. Part of my research, you know, I found this out. Does anybody have any idea what church, quote unquote, church real estate is worth in America? All the buildings, all the property, all the everything. $230 billion. $230 billion in America is spent on church, quote-unquote, buildings. Isn't that something? Can you imagine if we would have taken that money and put it into buying Bibles and tracts? You could give a brand new Bible to every man, woman, and child in this whole country. And not even come close to phasing that that amount of money. I mean, you could give one to every person alive on the planet, you know. Although, but we have to have our buildings. I mean, that's that's the most important thing. Now, I have three questions concerning this thing. Number one, who's going to get? Let's let's just assume for a minute that all these church buildings are filled with saved people. They're not, but let's just assume that. Who's going to get the church buildings? Who's going to get that $230 billion worth of real estate at the rapture? The Antichrist. That's a thought. I mean, you know, let's let's just say there's there's a church there and everybody's saved in it, you know, this big church building, and they're all good Christians and everything. Guess what's going to happen after the rapture? There's going to be people worshiping the Antichrist in that building. Why are you putting all the time and money into it? It's going to be given over to the Antichrist. And, of course, most of the church buildings are out there, especially the real big ones. Uh, most of the membership is going to be left behind. So, But question number two, has the $230 billion worth of churches in America stopped or increased sin and evil? Hey, we, we invested $230 billion in churches here in America. Why do we still have sin? Maybe we should spend more. Maybe we haven't spent enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of like borrowing your way out of debt, you know? Gasoline on the fire. Right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Isn't going to work. Um, question number three. Well, I already covered question number three. How many Bibles and gospel tracts could have been distributed? So, you know, I read that statistic and I just... $230 billion. It's amazing. Okay, point number five. Turn to Acts chapter 11, verse 26. This is a very familiar verse. And, of course, important when you get into the Bible version issue. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Where did Christianity begin? And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. Not Alexandria, Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, so Christianity really got its start, per se, where they were called Christians first in Antioch. 
why isn't there a church building in Antioch? I mean, why didn't they build the first church of the apostles? The first church of Jesus, you know, you see this all the time. First Baptist church, first Methodist church, you know, everywhere you go, there's always the first one. Why didn't, why didn't they build the first church of Antioch? The first church of the apostles or something, and it, it should still be there, you know? Why? Because they knew that they were supposed to get the gospel out. Now, they were training people here in Antioch. It was a center for Christians to come, be trained, but they were sending them out. Go out here, go there, go there. They weren't supposed to just, let's just camp in this area and let's let's make some good preaching. And we're going to have Paul in this week, and next week we're having Peter come down. We're going to fly him in, you know, and, and we got a hotel for him to stay at and all this. See, this thing that we call church today has no foundation in Scripture. It's just totally foreign. I mean, can you imagine taking Paul and putting him down today and saying, here, let's let's go into this big, huge church. He'd walk in and be like, what is this? Crystal chandeliers and mahogany pulpit up there, and look at the backdrop, and it, look at all these people, the way they're dressed and everything, and he'd be like, I'm getting out of here, you know? I mean, the only two churches, temples, mentioned in the book of Acts are the Jews and the pagans in Acts chapter 17, you know? They built temples. And it's kind of interesting, too, if you study some of the architecture of our modern church buildings, a lot of it goes back to paganism. You know, the steeple, the altar, all of that stuff. You know, the altar isn't down here. It's up there. Second Timothy chapter 2. Turn there next. This is probably my favorite portion of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Verses 3 and 4 are my two favorite verses in the entire Bible. But we'll look at uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And here again you see very good instruction and in righteousness for what we are supposed to be doing as Christians. Okay, there. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now that's very important because that's the job of, of pastors. When you learn and you study and you've, and you've learned all these things, your job is to teach others so that they can in turn teach other people. That way the, the gospel and doctrine and everything, it spreads out. You don't centralize it. We have it here in our university, in our college, in our church, and you come here to get it. No. It's supposed to be taught to others, and then they go out, and then they spread out. Look at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, we are called to be soldiers for Jesus Christ. A soldier, do you just continually have, I mean, I realize that you do do a lot of training to be a soldier, but is that all you do? No. You go out and you fight. Okay? And when, it, you know, you don't, you don't take basic training every single year as a soldier. You have your basic training, you get through it, you know, if you get into the Marines or into whatever, Okay, you're a soldier now. Go on out and fight. And it's your responsibility. You get a you know you get a veteran soldier. It's his responsibility to kind of take along the rookie and kind of keep him safe and watch over him. That's the way it's supposed to be as Christians. But instead, what do we do? Well, we build our little bases, you know, our base of operations, and then we have just this basic training all the time. And a lot of the soldiers, quote-unquote, a lot of Christians, are just sitting there getting the basic training over and over again. Because there again, the pastor doesn't want to get too into too weighty of doctrine because, you know, what if somebody that's here today is lost? You know, we got we got to give the gospel out all the time. See? So you have Christians in these big churches that are starving spiritually. They have questions, you know. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into that because that's kind of offensive to the lost. And there was a church we used to go to, and, they, and the guy used to always say, he was 
a waste of a preacher. But he used to always say, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. Which meant, we just got to be salvation all the time. Well, that's not your job as a pastor. The Bible says that you're to feed the flock of God. Not evangelize the lost. You do that out in the world. Uh, that's another point. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Okay, but we are to be soldiers. And now let me make another point. Um, if you are a soldier, what is your purpose? To fight. Now, if you're not going out and fighting with the world, going out door to door, witnessing to people, writing articles, doing whatever, if you don't have some kind of a ministry of reconciliation, of answering every man as we're supposed to do, who are you going to fight with? Church members. <laughs> How many church buildings are, are, that's all the people do? Go to a business meeting sometime. Fighting, 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 fighting. You know? Um, turn to, well, look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at the next point. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The next point, point number 6 is, we are in the last days, and the last days are a time of evil and apostasy, not revival. Okay, verse chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Let me just stop there for just one second. They're already trying to do Christmas. We haven't even hit Thanksgiving yet. You know, isn't it amazing? And, and, you know, they don't even say Thanksgiving. They say Turkey Day. That irritates me. We have a lot to be thankful for here in America. We really do. God has blessed this nation with a lot of things. We should be giving thanks. And I'm probably going to do maybe next week uh, the sermon about, you know, sacrifices of Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is something that is very scriptural. But you have people that are unthankful today, take things for granted. Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. Now look at this. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. What is the average big megachurch? It's lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You go there, they have events for everything. We're taking a trip to New York City. We're going to have a youth rally. You know, we're going to have a, a pool party. We're going to have a, a, you know, you name it. On and on and on. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If you'd sit them down and try to preach to them for an hour, they'd be complaining, looking at their watches. Oh, you know, is this going to be over soon? You know. But you could sit them down and go out to eat or go for a tour or whatever. They'd be fine sitting there for a couple hours. Why? Because they love pleasure more than they love God and more than they love God's Word. Okay, so turn over to chapter 4. We're going to look at a couple other verses here. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's kind of interesting. Yesterday we ran into two negatives and one positive. Two guys yelled at us and one guy commended us. There you have reprove, rebuke, exhort. <laughs> two negatives, one positive. Verse 3, For the time will come when they will, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Has this time come? Yes. We are living in a time when people cannot endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. They don't want anything to do with it. Now, let's build a church building. And let's fill it full of people because we're going to have a mighty revival in this land. No, we're not. How are you going to fill a church building today? By compromising. 
The only churches that are filled, that are packed out every Sunday, are the ones that are giving people pleasure. That's the only ones that are that are popular. You know, it. it like I said, I'm not totally against church buildings. I mean, back in the old days, they had the little country church building. You know, there's a special place in my heart for those. But you drive around the countryside now, they're empty. The doors are shut. Or if they aren't, you go past on a Sunday morning and there's three, four, five cars there. You know, and you go in to visit them and there's a couple people over here and a couple people over there. It's sad. Why? Because we are in the last days. And the last days are characterized by a great apostasy, a falling away. We're not going to have revival. Revelation chapter 3. Turn over there next. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And of course, if you've been part of this ministry for any length of time, you know where I'm going with this one. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Now, here you have the seven churches, and they were seven literal churches, but the Bible teaches us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, even though these were seven literal churches, you can also take it as instruction in righteousness. And you can see God is explaining a type of church, a type of Christian. Okay, verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see." As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay? That's a perfect description of modern Christian churches. They think that they have it made, and they don't. They don't know the Bible. They don't know the proper teaching of the Word of God. They're wretched, miserable. And it's interesting, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Now, without getting into a huge study of that, that leads us to the seventh point. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The seventh point, which I believe the gold tried in the fire is, is persecution. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Yeah, I don't know if I said that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. And here you have Paul speaking to the Corinthians and he is talking about there are different people coming in saying that they are ministers and that they're a better minister than Paul. And so Paul goes over some of what he's gone through for the Lord. Okay, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Hmm. In watchings and, or I'm sorry, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Boy, what a list of uh, qualifications for ministry. <laughs> you know, pretty amazing. But guess what? That's where we're headed. If the Lord tarries, that's where Christianity in America is headed. Real Christianity. True Bible believing Christianity. Okay, not the fake stuff. But notice there, he said, in perils among false brethren. 
Hmm. You mean there are false converts out there that are a danger to Christians? Yeah, a few of them. Just a couple. Uh, I'll read this here quickly. You don't have to turn there. John 16.2 says, The time that cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And that's very instructive of today. I have here um, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they have a section about militant extremists. And they it goes into things here, and it, and it says about such extremists may be motivated by issues of race, such as Ku Klux Klan, or Ku Klux Klan, excuse me, or other issues such as opposition to abortion or immigration. If you are against abortion, you are considered a possible domestic terrorist right now. And they are building. I, I saw a thing years ago where they were showing, you know, not too long after 9-11 happened, and they had a thing on about Islam, and they kept saying, fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist, fundamentalist, fundamentalist. They kept hitting that word, and I thought, they're really accenting that word fundamentalist. And it's like, they could easily spin that over on fundamentalist Christians. Anybody who's radical and isn't willing to, to give up their beliefs, you know, and to, and to compromise, well, they're, they're, you know, a possible terrorist. And it's interesting here because we have 40 Days of Purpose, Rick Warren's fabulous book here. And he says, the person who says, this is page 132, he says, the person who says, I don't need the church, is either arrogant or ignorant. Now, he's not talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about church buildings. Okay? Because he has a lot of opposition to you know, people oppose him, and you know, well, if you're not part of the church, and he talks in here, by the way, about nuns and priests and things like that, and he quotes three different Catholic, openly Catholic Bible versions, quotes a total of 15 different versions, whole other issue. But the point is, if you are not for him, he's saying you're either arrogant or ignorant. You know? Um, yeah. And then on the next page, he says, Today's culture of independent individualism has created many spiritual orphans, bunny believers who hop around from one church to another without any identity, accountability, or commitment. Many believe one can be a good Christian without joining or even attending a local church. But God would strongly disagree. The Bible offers many compelling reasons for being committed and active in a local fellowship. What happens when the church buildings are corrupt? You see? He is developing a structure where Bible-believing Christians are going to start being persecuted. Okay? And it's interesting. I, I read the CFR's website, and I did that for a reason. And you can look this up. Rick Warren is a member of the CFR. The CFR is an openly globalist organization. And you read this book. I've read the you know some occult writings and things. He almost plagiarizes different occultists. I mean, he quotes Aldous Huxley in here. Very prominent New Ager. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, and look at this one. This one is amazing too. Same page, page 133. You are not the body of Christ on your own. Huh? See? See that thing? of You have to be part of this church building, and if you're not, well, you're less than, you know, maybe you shouldn't even live kind of thing. It's that philosophy. He's building it. You need others to express that together, not separated. We are his body. Well, didn't the Bible tell us to come out from among them and be ye separate? Isn't that interesting? He's building the philosophy that the people would say, I will not submit to these new versions. I will not submit to this way that you're doing it. Well, you know, that's bad. And here he says on page 151, I'll read this yet, it means giving up our self-centeredness and independence in order to become interdependent. Now that's straight out of the New Age. They wrote a doctrine or a, a document called the Declaration of Interdependence back in the early 1900s, and it was a designed to get rid of the American Declaration of Independence. See, because we can't have sovereign nations now, we all have to be interdependent. See, just incredible. That guy is a Minister of Satan. 
There's no question in my mind. I mean, I heard, I heard that he was a member of the CFR, and I was kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know. You can look it up on YouTube. There is a video where he's being interviewed, and he just right out, I'm, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's not, you know, somebody heard that maybe it. He freely admits it to being a member of a globalist organization. So let me go over the seven points again very quickly. Uh, reason number one for house church, it's scriptural. Reason number two, a church is not a building. It's a body. It's a living body of Christ. Reason number three, modern church buildings bring lost and saved together, which the Bible says we're not to do. Reason number four, church buildings are an incredible waste of money. Reason number five, it helps the gospel spread out. And reason number, reason number six, last days are a time of evil and apostasy, not revival. Why would you want a church building? And number seven, uh, we're entering persecution, and we have to return to scriptural house churches. You see, it's very difficult to persecute a house church. It's very easy to persecute a building and to gain control of the building, which is what you have with 501c3, because you have you are not permitted to speak against political candidates. They put rules on you where you can't talk. They are silencing the pastors in this nation. So now I'm just going to go over very quickly here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. We're going to look at seven things that you can do to start a house church. If you are frustrated and you have some other Christians you know, that you can get together with, uh, this is the one that will typically be quoted. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. See, again, you have the saved. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much more, as so much the more as ye see the day approaching, the second coming of Christ, which I believe the book of Hebrews is specifically written to Jews in the tribulation, but we can take it again as instruction in righteousness. We should assemble ourselves together. That's important. You know, it's not good for you just to say, I don't want to be around any Christians. Well, you should try to find some Christians that you can fellowship with. If you're in a situation where you can't, you know, if you're in a Muslim country or something where you have to kind of watch what you say, okay, you can, you know, I think the Lord has some grace there. You can forsake the assembling of yourselves together, <laughs> you know, unless you know about some Christians and, and you know, you can get together, whatever. But there's a lot of resources on the Internet where you can hear preaching and teaching from the Word of God. And it's important that you do feed yourself, too, by the way. Um, but number one, you have to remember, if you want to start a house church, that it's the people, not a building. Now, if you have a building on your property that you could use to meet in, great, fine. You know, it's not that you can't have a building that's not a house. Meet wherever. Okay, you can meet in a field, you can meet in the woods, wherever. Okay, it's the people that are the church. That's the first most important thing to remember. Number two, uh, we're not going to turn there, but Acts chapter 20, verse 20 talks about they taught publicly and from house to house. Evangelism is outward. It's not inward. We go to the lost, they don't come to us. Okay, that's another thing that you have to realize. People say, well, if you have a house church, how do you get people saved? By going out to them. <laughs> you know, you don't put a little sign out in front of your house, you know, church this Sunday. No, it's for the saved people. You come together and you study the word of God so that you can go out and witness to the lost. That's what we're supposed to do. Reason or Number three, uh, do not abandon all standards. Okay, there's, that's one of the temptations of a house church is just to be this, you know, people sitting around in shorts and t-shirts and bare feet or something like that and, and just having a good old time and whatever. No, no. The Bible does teach modest apparel for women. There are to be some standards there yet. So you don't have to come in a suit and tie and the women in their finest Sunday dresses. and You don't have to do that. But don't abandon all standards. Okay, moderation. You know, that's the key there. Now, number four, only an experienced Christian man 
should lead the house church. Okay, you should search out which one of us, of the men, knows the Bible the best. Which one can instruct those? And it isn't, you have the authority now and you can't be questioned. That isn't it. It's just, who has the most experience? Who knows the Bible the most? And he should be the one that oversees and kind of says, okay, let's do this, let's try that, and and whatever. Okay, so that's important. Because the Bible does teach, First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, there, there is supposed to be a bishop. That's another movement in this whole house church thing, trying to eliminate any kind of a pastor figure. You're not supposed to do that. There is supposed to be a bishop. There is supposed to be an overseer. And he's not to be a novice. Okay, number five, I do believe that you should meet on the first day of the week. Now, is it commanded? Not necessarily, but... Three verses that are interesting. John 20, verse 19 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus came there on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until, until midnight. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So you see, Jesus meeting with them, they were meeting together in the upper room on the first day of the week, Paul preaching to them on the first day of the week, and then the third one there, they took up the offering on the first day of the week. The first day of the week would be Sunday. Okay, there again, there's another movement in the whole house church thing. They're trying to return to the Sabbath day. Okay, the Sabbath day is not for Christians in the body of Christ. Um, Ezekiel 20.20 says, And hallow, hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath was given to Israel as a sign. The Jews require a sign. Okay, Romans chapter 8, you have the Ten Commandments given. Remember, the Sabbath day is not one of them. Okay, the Sabbath day is not for Christians today. Okay, it will be for tribulation saints, let me say that. It is good, you know, meet on a Sunday, but also one night a week, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. It is good to meet for an informal Bible study where anybody can enter in. Still, you have a pastor that kind of leads it, directs it, oversees, but Make it informal. Study the Bible. Ask questions, you know. That's important, too. Uh, number six, get some old hymn books and sing. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 talks about speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. Singing should be part of your house church. That's very important. Okay, the Lord, I think, is, is that's a way that we worship the Lord. And I do believe that that's important. Um, and don't go with the modern Christian <clears throat> modern Christian stuff. That's worthless. Go back to the old hymns. Um, that's what honors the Lord. And again, you don't need to have a big full orchestra or anything like that. You can sing a cappella, as we do here. And number seven, set aside time for some type of, van- of evangelism. Street preaching, door-to-door, passing out tracts, something like that. You should have some kind of a ministry because that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Um, As far as anything else, uh, if you're listening to this sermon, you can contact us if you have any questions. Uh, Again, as far as a Christian needing to be trained so that they can train other people, you can write to us. You can contact us at Bible Believers Fellowship here. We'll give you as many materials as we can to train you. If you want to start a house church, we'll help you out the best that we can. If you want to contact us, our website is www.kjvbbf.com. Also, Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 118, Hopeland, PA 17533. And you can feel free to contact us with any questions that you might have. Thank you. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. 
If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.